Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're starting the session just in case you're checking the room is uh, um, building a global partnership for responsible cyber behavior. Uh, my name is Louise Marie Rell. I am a research fellow over at the Royal United Services Institute, which is a think tank based um, in London. Uh, so we work with security and defense and we have a cybersecurity program over there. Um, and I'm, I'm leading a project that's on responsible cyber behavior. And today I'm very happy to welcome you all to what is the regional launch of an initiative as part of this project, which is called the Global Partnership for Responsible Cyber Behavior. Um, so what is then the Global Partnership and why is this important before I turn to our, our great speakers, both here and online? Um, so the focus of the Global Partnership is really to map practical understandings of what responsible cyber behavior means, how it's interpreted uh, by different stakeholders. And for this first year, um, we're looking specifically at how states um, see responsibility in practice, what are the regional nuances, what are the contextual and cultural elements that shape the understanding of responsibility. Um, and we have, um, as part of this global partnership, we have a structure, so we have an advisory board, and I see that Chris uh, is over here in the room representing the advisory board. Thank you, Chris. Um, we also have members, so the global partnership is consists mostly of researchers and research institutions from across different regions. So we have over 70 scholars and researchers involved. Um, and the idea is that we have working streams for each of the regions and we'll be producing uh, regional papers out of that, which will be a global compendium on responsible cyber behavior throughout this next year. So it's quite exciting. Stay tuned. Um, but as part of, um, of thinking about the global partnership, right, I think there's a bigger question of why is this important, why is this relevant, and why now? Um, so for those that have been following closely, the UN negotiations, the open-ended working group, um, there are increasing tensions, right, and there are things and tough questions that sometimes it's very hard to deal from let's say, a, a, a diplomacy or a geopolitical kind of standpoint. But as a research community, this is something that we can do. We can ask uh, tough questions. We can come together and look at our differences and our commonalities as researchers from across different regions. And, um, and I think there are other some challenges, some challenges that, that are, let's say, in the background of, of this conversation. So first, there's uh, a lot of understanding or let's say even publication around you know uh, big powers that often dominate the debate and that's fine i mean but that leaves little space um for other regions and other countries to kind of vocalize their own kind of like understandings and interpretations so i think it's important to think about you know how do we think uh, the research agenda around that second is that international peace and security discussions are the highest level of conversation that one can have when it comes to, let's say, responsibility in cyberspace, right? Um, and obviously, in the context of the UN, we're talking about negotiating a document, right? So it's a place where you actually have an output, which is a consensus document, and you don't necessarily see the regional nuances in, in those particular documents. And perhaps you're just focusing on the highest political angle. So responsibility is potentially not just that. There are other layers that we need to consider. Um, and finally, um, that there is, you know, of course, um, a need for a greater, let's say, contextual or cultural understanding of what are the values that come into each country's way of seeing and perceiving responsibility, in addition to these, um, these um, norms that have been agreed at the international level. So um, to think about that and to reflect, I think there's nothing better to do this over at the IGF where we can actually have a multi-stakeholder perspective. So that's the objective of our conversation here today is to bring stakeholders from each stakeholder group to reflect on how they see responsibility in cyberspace in practice, to have their views. So we're going to pick a bit. So it's a snapshot of each of them because we only have an hour. But definitely and hopefully this is a trigger for food for thought and for future, let's say, conversations that we can have around each of these topics. So today with me we have two people online, um, but I'll present all of them right now. So we have Regine Greenberger, which is joining us online. She was here. Uh, some of you might have seen her, but she unfortunately had to leave. But she's very kindly agreed to, to join us and committed to uh, being online. So thanks, Regine. Regine is the cyber ambassador at the German Federal Foreign Office. We also have Pablo Castro over here on my side. He's the cybersecurity coordinator at the Chilean MFA. 
Um, and you have you seem you have a crowd cheering for you over there as well. Uh, we have on my other side John Herring, which is the senior government affairs manager at Microsoft. Um, we also have Charlotte Lindsay, which is joining us online. Um, she is the chief public policy officer at the Cyber Peace Institute, and we also have Eugene Tan. He is an associate uh, research fellow at the Ranjaratnam Ranjarat School of International Studies, and I hopefully I pronounced that correctly, which is the shorthand for ISIS. Um, we also have Koichiro Komiyama, uh, which is the director of Global Coordination Division at JP CERT. So as you see, we have a lineup of you know government representatives, private sector, academia, and technical community here. But I'll stop talking now because I think the most interesting bit is for us to have this kind of back and forth. And Regine, I hope you're here with us uh, in cyberspace and that we can see you at any point. Um, is she online? Can I confirm with the, uh, is she online, Regine? Yes, wonderful. So Regine. I am, I am. Hi. Wonderful. Hi, Regine. Thanks for Hi. joining us. Um, so, Regine, uh, th the idea of this convert is really to be a conversation, right? So it's supposed to be dynamic. Regine, I wanted to start with you for us to unpack some of the layers when it comes to what responsible cyber behavior means in practice, right? So while the discussion at the UN has really provided this uh, framework for responsible state behavior, um, there's still many nuances that we are kind of exploring, right? Uh, for some states, for example, responsibility might be seen as calling out bad behavior or irresponsible uh, behavior through public attribution, right? Um, or sanctions, let's say. So how has Germany been positioning itself with regards to that? Could you elaborate a bit? Yeah, thank you, uh, Louise. Uh, first of all, congratulations on, on the creation of this global platform. I think uh, both the past OEWG and the current w OEWG and also the ad hoc committee uh, negotiations on cyber crime show that, you know, the era when uh, cyber norms were only uh, negotiated by few capable states is definitely over. We we have now uh, the whole UN member states, uh, the part members uh, involved in these negotiations, and also uh, a lot more of um, non-governmental stakeholders, which is a good sign. But still, we need more smart people to sort out the complex issues that we that we have here. So I'm really grateful that you established this uh, platform. Now, for your question, I wouldn't start with attribution. The first thing um, that I would like to mention how states can strengthen the normative framework is, is of course, implemented. Uh, it sounds a little bit trivial, but it is not. I mean, we in Germany have no problem with uh, the negative norms, so refrain from, we would never attack critical infrastructure, but uh, the positive norms, so like protect critical infrastructure are much more difficult to implement. We have, for example, at the moment, uh, negotiations about um, a national law that is going to implement uh, a new directive on the European level. It's the NIS directive, which is a um, legislation to, pro uh, to protect critical infrastructure. It sets ben benchmarks and standards for entities uh, of critical infrastructure. And it will request a lot more of cybersecurity experts to actually do this. I mean, to do all the jobs that are uh, mentioned in this uh, legislation. So where do we find them? So this is very difficult to implement. Then the second thing that states can do is of course, monitor their own implementation and share it with others. In the last OEWG, we had, uh, we had discussions about a national survey. I think it was a Mexican proposal. And I think it's a very good thing to document also what you are going or what you are doing in order to implement cyber norms. It's also a way to share best practices and get others uh, on board. And as we all know, it's a cross-border um, endeavor to implement the cyber norms. So this is also a possibility to define the interfaces between national jurisdictions. Then uh, the third element I would like to mention still before attribution is capacity building. And this is, has been uh, defined in the last uh, negotiation round as a two-way street. We had a very nice panel also during IGF uh, describing you know, the challenges to coordination for cyber capacity building measures. And I think um, we, we all have to do a lot more work to get this really going. There, it's not only a question of money, it's also a question of, again, uh, human resources that have to be invested, but also 
um, coordination to get the right things done. And then the last thing is attribution. Attribution is holding a, uh, malicious actors accountable. It's very difficult in practice, but it's doable. We reject this notion that we cannot properly attribute. I think we can. We have technical possibilities and we have to use, of course, also political judgment to put this in the international, the observations that we do on a technical level to put these into an international context. So um, we have uh, established in Germany a national attribution procedure. The foreign ministry is the pen holder of this procedure and it works together with all other ministries and agencies and intelligence services who might have uh, intelligence or other facts to contribute to this procedure. And we do it in a very thorough, responsible way so that when we go out with an attribution a decision, um, you can be sure that we have the necessary, uh, the necessary, you know, background information collected, and that this is something that um, is not done. It's a political attribution because it's a political decision, but in the in the basis there is a there is a, a, a really a fact based and resp responsible uh, analysis of of what has happened. So um, sanctions still is something else. It doesn't require attribution and uh, attribution doesn't require automatically sanctions. Uh, but in the European Union within the diplomatic toolbox, uh, we have, a, we have a, also the instrument of sanctions to use it uh, together. And this is something that we will probably see more often in the future. Uh, there's a lot of appetite for sanctions out there because malicious behavior is really increasing um, from from different sides. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regine. And um, and I think what we what we see from your let's say points is that there are positive levers to thinking about responsibility, right? So a positive understanding of responsibility where you build capacities, where you think about you know the development of national laws and how do you connect that with the regional level when it comes to the EU, right? I mean, implementing um, things like the NIS directive um, and also monitoring implementation. But there are also, let's say, negative, not in the sense of um, a judgment call on it, but negative in the sense of what it proposes, right? Um, there are also like levers such as attribution and then sanctions that are within, let's say, the statecraft toolbox uh, to think about responsibility as something that's external, right? So there's the internal responsibility of the state to necessarily kind of have the capabilities and the capacities to, you know, be held accountable when it comes to its own citizens. But there's also the external responsibility over there when thinking about, you know, if another state is is acting or you know a non-state actor that's within another state and and vice versa that that um, applies that vision of responsibility externally. So, Regine, thanks a lot. I'm. Given our time, I'm going to try to do like a first round of questions. And if we have time, I'll do the second round of questions just because I'm mindful of that. So, Pablo, um, so passing over to you, I know that over in Chile, there's a lot of dis discussions about the development of a national policy right now and also a national law, right? I mean, focusing on cybersecurity. Um, how does it work then? And I know that one of the components is trying to connect, let's say, the domestic uh, institutions development, the principles with, let's say, the, the framework for responsible state behavior and the implementation of international law in cyberspace. So how can you explain a little bit more and give us a little bit of a s uh, an insight into that process? Because as I know, it's still underway, right? Thank you, Luis. Thank you for the time into the very on time. Um, well, thanks very much for this invitation. It's a very <coughs> important, fascinating topic. And also congratulations on the global partnership. Well, it's still a challenge because basically in Chile we started back in 2017 when we released our first national cybersecurity policy. And that policy, well, we tried to cover many things in cybers, you know. And but um, we set up I mean five goals. One one of them was related with the foreign policy, which is very important because for the first time the Minister of Foreign Affairs was really engaged in this process. And we basically what we did was okay, our foreign policy has a lot of you know principles. And we basically said those principles also apply to cyberspace, you know, um, respect of uh, uh, international law, uh, promotion of human rights, you know, um, strengthening multilateralism, and, and so on. So we said those principles are there, part of the foreign policy, and also a part of our view and policy in cyberspace. 
that's very important for us because it was quite easy in, uh, at that moment to start, I mean, uh, this work. Uh, there's still, I think, uh, uh, and, and then our cyber defense policy was released in back in uh, 2018, was also very I important because it was, I think, the, one of the first time with the, uh, uh, we basically said um, statement like, the, for example, cyber operation would be conducted under uh, the respect of international law, uh, IHLs, and I, uh, international law, human rights. And it was actually an initiative coming from the Ministry of Defense, part of the whole this process, you know. That even before that, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs started, I mean, made those sort of, of statements. So, uh, of course, in coordination with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, unfortunately, maybe this policy is not maybe too well known because it was released, I think, uh, one week before the new administration, so I mean, in, in 2018. But it is in English, so if everyone wants a copy of it, I'm really happy even to share it with you. And I think it's still a lot of challenge that, that we would like to address in the new uh, national cybersecurity policy, which is the text is ready. Uh, it was approved by the Interministerial Committee on Cybersecurity in May this year. And was, uh, we expect that we can be released, you know, during uh, 2023. Uh, the new policy is actually mean a commitment to promoting, you know, uh, international norms, uh, the application of uh, the um, international law in cyberspace, CBS, which is a very important component of our foreign policy. There's uh, been a, long, a lot of work we're doing at the level of the OIS with the uh, established 11 CBMs in, in cyberspace. And also, we will have the commitments to work in an international uh, cooperation strategy in our cyberspace, and also on um, a national position in international law uh, in cyberspace. I mean, uh, it doesn't mean we are not trying I mean, to work on this, but now it's gonna be part of the mandate of, of, the, new, of the new policy, and I think that's gonna be very important, because it's basically a commitment, you know, it's coming from the president, and so we have a mandate, and so we have to be compelled to work on this. But I think it's still a challenge when it comes to responses to state behavior in our regions, because, I mean, regime was mentioned, for example, attribution. There's not gonna be too much discussion about attribution right now in our regions to see, I mean, what other states think about it, uh, in my own experiences, sometimes it's been complicated when you speak and talk with your authority, say, may, uh, we were maybe under attack for some uh, foreign power or something. And the question is, what is the benefit of making this on attribution? I mean, uh, is something necessary to do or made a press release? But I think uh, uh, there are some benefits, and it's something we still need to discuss more internally at the level of the government, other ministries. As you know, in, in Latin America, you have this problem of governance of cybersecurity, where you don't have uh, sometimes a national cybersecurity agencies are in charge of this. You have committees, et cetera. So that discussion is something that still needs to improve more and exchange view with other states, you know. We've been trying, I mean, to promote this sort of dialogue. I mean, what other state thinks about the application to national law, what is your experience in, on implementing the 11 norms for on? I would like to mention what we said about capacity building, which is now a region is critical. It's very important. I think the OIS has been playing a very, and a very important role uh, with a lot of training courses regarding I, um, application of international law. Because basically, if you want to take some important decision in this, on and just develop a national position, you need people that could be uh, really understand what we're talking about. So I think uh, that's could be, I mean, uh, my, the only, I think, lawyer we have right now in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is re really good, and it's thanks to the training that we have thanks to the OIS. And I want to actually, in that, in that case, highlight the, uh, I mean, outstanding uh, work that has been done for some states like Canada, the United States, Estonia, the UK, they've been actually helping to us with these uh, training courses. I can now also mention the uh, uh, Global Emerging Leaders Program of on cybersecurity. Uh, thanks to that program uh, right now on it, uh, the Internet Global Forum, because basically they one of the main focus to promote responsible state behavior. So I think it's something that's quite important in terms to promote this sort of dialogue. And I think global partnerships can play a very good role in our regions to try to, you know, create a sort of a space where a state can come together, exchange point of view. But as I said it before, it's still a challenge. There's a lot of things we can do. My aim is the next time there could be an attack to uh, one state in our region, as Costa Rica, we can maybe come together and make a collective response to say we really condemn this attack. Not maybe necessarily to say who was behind it, but as the leaks to show this sort of condemnation. And it's something I think it's something that it can be done, you know. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And I think this, it, it's interesting to have 
two government representatives kind of in, in this panel because then you have kind of two ways of thinking about, right, or the nuances already of thinking about that internal dimension. And Pablo, you mentioned, you know, the, the whole development and the history of how Chile arrived where it is right now and what it needs to kind of like, it's important to have the policy right now because then the whole conversation of how to better connect the, you know, the domestic side of things and how the policies have been developed with the international kind of law and how to advance and to have that mandate, as you said, to be able to do that, which is quite important. And we know that in terms of policy making in the region, it's, it's, it's really always about that. Um, and I think your point on attribution is also quite interesting, right? It's not necessarily that there's a political interest in naming and shaming, but that on the other hand, this external responsibility is something that you know, there needs to be a further trust building within the region to think about what are the channels, how can we make the POC directory within the, the CBMs uh, at the OES kind of advance in that way and be um, more implementable. So now I wanted to shift to you, John, because we talked a lot about states, uh, but I think, you know, a huge part of the whole conversation about responsible cyber behavior goes through the private sector, right? It's, it's thinking specifically like big companies like Microsoft, right, as we've been seeing um, its engagements. So I wanted to do a very, very quick kind of question, and I think I'll do a sandwich already with the second question that I was gonna ask you because I'm quite excited about that one. Um, so the first one is really kind of, so as I said, responsible cyber behavior is broader than just thinking about state behavior. Um, so what are the main lessons learned um, and p perhaps the challenges of bringing together the private sector within the tech accord? I mean, many people, I imagine some might be familiar, but others might not. So do you want to just do like a quick uh, reply on that and then I'll just go for my second question because I'm very excited about it. <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. Um, thank you so much for having us and, uh, and thanks to IGF for putting on this session. For those who are, are unfamiliar, the Cybersecurity Tech Accord is a coalition of now 167, 168 uh, technology companies from around the globe committed to some foundational cybersecurity principles. But really was it, it, what it is is trying to be um, the industry organization that gives the industry a voice on matters of peace and security online. Um, and the group's been around for uh, what, five and a half years now. Um, and I'll tell you what has not been a challenge is, is getting folks on the same page on that. Um, it's sort of uh, been remarkable how much there's been a, uh, a lot of interest in, in joining the group. We kicked off in 2018 with just 34 companies and then pushing 170 now. And I think that re reflects a lot of pressure that companies feel across the industry from our customers uh, as cyberspace continues to emerge the domain of conflict uh, to make clear where do we stand, uh, you know, what is our role uh, as the folks who are you know, developing the products and services that are so often, um, you know, weaponized by, by various actors, but including uh, increasingly governments. Um, so, you know, that's, that it's been easy to sort of get folks on board to say, hey, we have, you know, commitments to good security, protecting our customers. We are not interested in, in weaponizing our products and services to, to undermine peaceful security um, or peaceful technology. Uh, one of the challenges, though, is just sort of, I think, getting companies that have just such widely different capacities on, on, on the same page. Um, you know, some companies, like you said, are very large multinational firms and have the resources to dedicate to some of these challenges. And, and, and for many of the companies that have joined the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, beforehand familiarity with UN processes on peace and security online were very, very foreign. Um, and so it's, it's been interesting to sort of bring a, a broader swath of the industry into the conversation. Uh, and we've also seen, I think, some real meaningful progress um, taken across the industry by virtue of the work of the Tech Accord. Maybe most notably, you know, uh, starting a few years ago, we started encouraging companies to have um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies in place as a matter of, um, of just sort of baseline expectation. Uh, when we started calling on companies to do that within the group, there were, I think, maybe a, a dozen or so uh, CVD policies that we could find easily online. And today you can find over 100 coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies from across um, that Tech Accord signatory base that are reviewable online and can serve as a, a proof point, I think, for action for that group, but then also a point of reference for other companies seeking to think about, well, what would a CVD policy look like in our particular context? So that's just one example. And yes, we'd be brief, so I'm going to cut there. No, that's fine. And I said I was going to do one round, but I, I'm going to squeeze in, um, just because of our time, um, the second question over here to you, John, which is, you talked about the Tech Accord, and I think it's a really interesting kind of like endeavor to kind of bring folks together from industry and across, as you said, like different levels, you know, not necessarily just strictly tech companies, right? I mean, that in that case. Um, but when we think about Microsoft's role specifically, and I mean, that doesn't apply just to Microsoft, but maybe other companies that have been engaging like in context of conflict, 
crisis scenarios, right? I mean, the war, um, the Russia Ukrainian war. Um, so, what is the role then of the private sector in those contexts, right? What is the responsibility of the private sector in engaging in conflict situations, um, as we've been seeing right now in Ukraine? So, what would you say about that? So a lot of that question I don't think is, is my place or Microsoft's place to answer in terms of what is the proper role of, of industry as it relates to, to armed conflict. I will say it's something that's been thrust to the, th uh, thrust to the fore, though, in the past year and a half since the, the war in Ukraine started, and certainly Michael Microsoft has played a, a very forward-leaning role here. I should say that the tech accord early on in the conflict also did come out with a statement on industry responsibilities in times of armed conflict. Um, but in particular, for, for Microsoft, I think we we focus on doing three things as it relates to the conflict in Ukraine. Um, the first is hardening security for, for our customers that are in the region. If you're going to be in a, you know, exposed to particularly um, you know, sophisticated threat actors, making sure we're providing the best security that we can. We did a lot of work to migrate Ukrainian data into secure cloud environments, um, which you know, made data centers in Ukraine kind of redundant targets. Um, we also did a lot of work then on the active defense side. I'd say that's the second thing we've done. We've responded to now, I think, upwards of, of 10 different you know, generations of wiper malware um, in the context of the, of the uh, operations targeting Ukrainian data. Um, and then the third, and this has been, I think, something we've, we've leaned into more over the past year in particular, is um, regular reporting on what we're seeing in the context of, of the war in Ukraine. Um, We've redoubled, uh, I think, a lot of our, our efforts around um, threat context analysis in particular, so not just talking about what one cyber event was, but painting a picture about the, the activities of a, of a broad threat actor group, how they're aligned then, often and oftentimes with a military campaign. Uh, we've seen often you know, missile strikes either immediately preceding or, or taking place right, right after uh, uh, cyber operations, uh, often against the same targets or same geographies. Microsoft obviously can't know the level of coordination and where that takes place um, w within, you know, gov government agencies, but the co uh, correlation would seem to suggest that. Um, and then the other, but Microsoft certainly hasn't been alone in this. Uh, there have been a lot of private sector companies that have been leaning forward in that in similar ways. And then obviously a, a lot of the success of that of those efforts to thwart um, cyber operations in the context of that conflict uh, are attributable to the work of the, the Ukrainian CERT, uh, which was, you know, so prepared to readily provide necessary authorizations, to move quickly, to uh, coordinate the efforts of, of a broad multi-stakeholder coalition. Uh, this is sort of the first example we've ever seen of, of large-scale hybrid warfare. Uh, it certainly won't be the last, uh, but I think one silver lining and encouraging element here is that it looks like a you know, robust multi-stakeholder coalition that is well-coordinated and determined um, can at least ensure that as this emerges as a domain of conflict, there can be you know, asymmetric benefits to defenders. Wonderful. I think that gives us a lot of food for thought. I mean, of course, um, there are various types of companies engaged, right? I mean, tech companies, threat intelligence companies, and you can go more and more kind of like um, nuanced in, in the classification of companies involved in, in conflict, right? I mean, they're, they're evolving questions of whether, you know, they, they are combatants or not, uh, on whether, you know, the, the private sector has an extra responsibility because they're, um, they're infra infrastructure providers. But anyway, I wanted to pass over to Charlotte because since we're talking about conflict situations, I wanted to also talk about the more, let's say, human element and the organizations that sometimes are the primary target um, or, let's say, the ones that suffer the spillover of a lot of that uh, geostrategic competition. So, Charlotte, um, I don't know if you can hear us. I just wanted to check. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Lovely. Thanks so much, Charlotte. It must be so early over there. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, so, Charlotte, um, I know that Cyber Peace Institute has been doing a really great work in trying to measure the impact of the harms that cyber incidents um, have to civilians and to civil society organizations. Um, and normally, individuals and civil society organizations and, you know, the third sector are left by themselves to actually know how to best respond or to protect themselves and their infrastructure. So could you share a little bit more what can be done better to support these groups? Thank you, and good afternoon. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, but thank you for inviting me today. So yes, the Cyber Peace Institute has been um, working to understand the, the impact and harms of, of cyber attacks. And I think, firstly, it's important to 
to build evidence and data-driven understandings of the harm inflicted by cyber attacks. There's always a lot of hypotheses, um, but I think what we've been trying to do is really foster more context-aware approaches so of the harms and impacts so that we can also look at them what's the best way to support and engage in capacity building and building resilience for particularly vulnerable communities. Um, and so I think that has that's a very good starting point, understanding the evidence and data driven um, impact and harms. Um, what we've been looking at, for example, a particular vulnerable group who've become more and more impacted and targeted by cyber attacks are humanitarian and human rights and, and development organizations that are working to support uh, victims of armed conflict um, and, and vulnerable populations in, in crisis situations. And what we have done there is really built both a humanitarian cybersecurity center, but also a very specific cyber peace builders uh, program where we match uh, uh, the needs of uh, individual organizations to um, cyber resilience uh, and capacity building support that can be provided free to those organizations to help them respond um, and build their capabilities to, um, to prevent or to respond to attacks. And I think that's a very important point. But then also on the policy side, it's really important to take the, the understanding and lessons learned from that and inject that understanding into policy um, discussions, for example, at the Open-Ended Working Group or the Ad Hoc Committee on the Cybercrime Convention in order to be able to say, look, this is what is happening and this is what needs to be done um, to, to pre prevent that. Uh, another particularly vulnerable community we saw during the pandemic was a healthcare community. And we saw also during the, the, the pandemic, particularly the, 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 the heightened two years of the pandemic, we saw increasing attacks against um, very critical infrastructure, the healthcare inf infrastructure linked to the response uh, to, the, to the pandemic. One of the things that we did with our partners there, which is the Czech, the government of the Czech Republic, Microsoft uh, and the, the Cyber Peace Institute, we built um, a multi-stakeholder compendium on best practices on protecting the healthcare sector from cyber harm, which was looking at really practical recommendations that could improve the resilience and protection of the healthcare sector. So another concrete way is looking at the data, what it's telling us about how what the harms are, putting together the, those people who are impacted uh, from the healthcare sector in this case, looking um, at practical recommendations of what's worked and then building that into to resilience programs. And then just lastly, we've been working uh, over the last two years on the cyber attacks in times of conflict, particularly related to the Ukraine and Russian conflict. And there we are monitoring currently at the moment 112 different threat actors who are very loud and proud about the attacks that they've been carrying out. They have been self-attributing. So obviously that there still needs to be more technical policy, legal attribution behind that. But I think that speaks to what Regina and Pablo were talking about at the beginning about um, being very clear about the responsibility of states also um, to make sure that attacks don't happen from their territory or to then potentially hold persons accountable for that. And I think where that will be very important steps going forward, looking at how um, those who've breached the laws and norms are going to be held accountable. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And I think that starts to paint to us like a, let's say a gradient of understandings of responsibility that are complementary, right? We discuss the national, like the inter like the domestic and the external notion of responsibility when we're talking about, you know, statecraft and what that means when it comes to um, to applicability of the norms. We talked about the private sector and the evolving understanding of what it means to engage in conflict situations being accompanied. Not that private sector has not been involved in like in conflict. I mean, when we look at other, let's say, contexts, it's not new. But I think when we're talking about the, the tech sector engaging um, in, in protecting and providing support and assistance, then maybe we're talking about new dimensions of responsibility over there. And now um, looking at the third sector, looking at civil society organizations and what um, the Cyber Peace Institute has been doing, I think there's extra layer of responsibility there, which is thinking about how the civil society organizations can feed back into government um, and say, you know, these are the harms, be very thorough about the data that we collect 
and, um, and be able to, to hold them accountable for the actions and the spillovers of many of these activities, right? And uh, Charlotte, um, I will get back to you on the second question, definitely. So I will now pass it over to um, Eugene. So Eugene, now, now we're on the sweet spot because, you know, as a person that comes from academia, you know, um, my, my heart goes out to you as well as, as a fellow uh, person from the same sector. So I was wondering, you know, at, at, at the heart of the, the global partnership really lies this commitment to foster research-led dialogue um, with different views from different countries and regions on the topic. Are we doing enough as a research community um, to really connect those realities? Uh, or are we really in our own silos? So how has IRSIS kind of done and worked through those different silos? Thanks, Louise. Uh, so let me first say that it's an honor and a privilege for RSIS to be involved in this project. And I think this project represents a wonderful opportunity for us to shape and build what responsible behavior in cyberspace looks like from a global, multi-stakeholder perspective through dialogue and research. So for the longest time, I think academic research has been done on a very individual uh, regional case study basis uh, where actions by states are documented and uh, on the actions and co commitments made by states uh, and it's from this where we draw what we think is best practice and also maybe implement it in an arbitrary manner. So what I think has been lacking in research is this common measurement of what responsibility actually is which is what makes this project so exciting. Um, what this makes this project doubly exciting is how wide the consultation is and the intersectionality that each individual uh, on this panel or online or e even in this room here brings to um, the, the whole project. Uh, this means the discussions, the findings come from a group of uh, people and not just a snapshot from a specific region or from an academic pers perspective, but rather one which considers a wider context of responsibility with states, industry, civil society, academic view coming together on a very global scale. So brings, bring back to your question about um, s having the need to connect different realities uh, when doing comparative studies among the region. Uh, so I think as an academic community, we haven't necessarily done enough talking across regions, and academics tend to focus more on our individual contexts when talking about cybersecurity. This can be uh, area studies, these could, can be um, specific topics uh, that you're interested in. Um, but I think that has been changing, especially when funding is um, starting to come online where academics like myself um, can actually interface with um, different regions. Um, I mean, I, I met you first in Mexico. Uh, what, what's an ASEAN person meeting? <laughs> Someone who's based in Europe uh, doing in Mexico, right? Uh, so doing so uh, helps us build that bridge uh, helps us understand the different contexts that we actually reside in. And I think uh, this broadens um, our the richness in conversation, broadens the um, conversations that we have, and um, I think I think we are all richer for that. Yeah. Wonderful, and I wanted to follow up on that actually, Eugene. And uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, the, the need to connect to the global, let's say, research community around this and definitely it's at the heart of what the, the GPRCB, the Global Partnership for Responsible Cyber Behavior seeks to do. But Eugene, what can we do better? I mean, you started alluding to some points over there, but what can we do better to develop a research agenda that's more attentive to the cultural, contextual kind of elements that might play into defining responsible cyber behavior. So you're asking an academic, fellow academic, how to do research design. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> because I mean, this is part of what we can do, right? Yeah, so personally, I think because this is a global study, it's gonna be really difficult to control 
uh, for all the cultural and contextual elements uh, across the region and different states. So what would be reasonable would be pull to pull out the common strands of what uh, constitute responsible behavior and note these deviations from the norm. Um, this would enable us to put out a document uh, which potentially um, defines responsible behavior as a baseline rather than building on uh, existing research, which is to provide a case study on how states think or how businesses think, uh, how they're being responsible. Because it's, it's such a nebulous concept of responsibility, right? There is no uh, one measurement like I uh, was speaking about earlier because there's no one measurement. Everyone thinks they're responsible, right? Um, so it's how we draw out these extra measures, um, how, how we could actually inform the whole community as a whole, how these extra measures can be actually implemented uh, that um, will bring value to the whole ecosystem. Absolutely, and I think, you know, it's, it's if what I'm hearing potentially is, you know, painting a spectrum of responsibility. So we already have the norms, right? They are at the international level. How they're interpreted, we have the area studies, of course, but I think is, I think your point on understanding the deviation element is quite fundamental, right? And how do we access those, let's say, practices to be able to draw that. So that is part of what we'll be doing like in the next year. So that's quite exciting. I wanted now to turn to Koichiro. Um, so Koichiro, you, you know, you have been engaged in so many different bits and pieces of the, um, of the technical community, right? As JP Surge being part of first uh, advisory board and so on and so forth. So I wanted to speak to you particularly about, you know, the certs have a really important role. So at the UN, you know, the norms, there's a norm to protect certs against being targets. Um, and they have a fundamental role in maintaining uh, the security of networks and systems and um, for many years now. But many countries have now establishing, have established reporting requirements, right? And we already discussed that a bit. Um, for incidents. Is it realistic to expect organizations to report incidents within a short time frame sometimes, or to have governments require that some vulnerabilities and incidents be first reported to them? So I see that there's a responsibility from the side of, of the CERT community, right? But is it realistic to expect some certain things from, especially when it comes to, to vulnerability reporting and reporting requirements, is it realistic to expect that to given your experience in the field? Uh, thank you, Ruiz. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Koichiro Spaki Komiyama from uh, Japan Computer Emergency Response Team. Um, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Ruiz mentioned the, the role of CSUIT or CERT um, uh, to protect the global internet. Um, and my contribution is uh, to explain the role of CSUIT has been changed slightly uh, since the last few, few years. Uh, I have three points. First, um, of course, we see more rules or regulation or uh, local registration uh, for uh, for anyone to report the uh, vulnerability and incident to uh, authorities, uh, which also which includes, for example, India's case uh, reporting cybersecurity incident to uh, South India, the Indian third, uh, within a few hours uh, of occurrence. Or uh, since I spent a week in IGF meeting room uh, this week, I just learned that Sri Lanka will have a similar uh, regulation in a few months. And um, I also like to note certain, you know, uh, there are many other uh, authority or government agencies who to receive the uh, security incident reports. Uh, for our case, Japan, if there's a Cybersecurity incident, they share information with JP Sar or National Cybersecurity Center. But if it is a, if the case is associated with personal information leak, then uh, they have another uh, another uh, government-led uh, commission, uh, which they are mandated to uh, report up. Uh, and just recently, uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission also uh, in. Um, 
introduce a new regulation uh, for instant disclosure to uh, U.S. financial institutions. Now, my second point is, you may be not familiar with what we are receiving. For example, JP said uh, we received 20,000 cases or incidents per year. And about half of the cases or half of the incidents, we need to engage or we need to communicate with someone in the United States, the, the ISPs, platformers, researchers in the United States. Then that's, that's a half of, uh, half of our, our received report. Another 30 to 40 percent, we need to reach out to China. So U.S.-China combined is, is more than 80 percent. Um, and from this fact, I like to suggest you cyberspace may not be as global as you imagine. Uh, what's crucial on the internet is not this uh, not very, um, not not very distributed, but rather concentrated in in a few places on Earth. And um, the other thing is, um, you know, often regulator misunderstood. If they got more information, they can make uh, more accurate decision or assessment. Um, to us, like among, among 20,000 20, of incident cases, what we like to see is less than 1%. Uh, only you know, less than 100 cases can be used or can be very beneficial for us to uh, analyze what type of AT APT attack is is happening, uh, which specific Japanese critical infrastructure is uh, compromised already, and others. The rest is not a garbage, but uh, is, is, not, is not something, you know, uh, is not very informative or uh, actionable, uh, at least for us. Now, I'd like to conclude my last point. Uh, the, the worst case scenario is, is the local registration hinder or undermine the uh, international or global information sh sharing, which we have been, we have been doing for the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, Log4j is a very good example. Uh, there's a common uh, software library uh, widely used uh, everywhere. And this vulnerability was first uh, identified by a Chinese researcher working for uh, Alibaba's subsidiary. Uh, they, they made a great job uh, to identify the issue uh, and then also sharing it with uh, Log4j developers immediately. But uh, far from being praised or get a reward, uh, you know, they are summoned by Chinese authority. And since then, um, there's a chilling effect among Chinese uh, security researcher community, I do not expect they can be, sh you know, uh, they can share vulnerability information with, for example, JP said or um, other government agencies in, in the future. So, um, like we see data being localized, we also see uh, uh, vulnerability information being being localized. Um, and um, we are in the middle of the process, and I don't have, um, yeah, and I like to, you know, together with you, I like to explore how we can fix this issue and, you know, make or uh, make sure vulnerable information being shared among stakeholders who should be, or well, who, who should know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Koichiro. I think then we see a double entendre over there because it's a, uh, on the one hand, you know, the states, and we go back to like Regina and, and Pablo over here, where they were talking about, you know, as a state, we need to actually kind of develop le regulations and develop national policies that we make sure that we have, you know, vulnerability disclosure, that we have kind of like procedures in place. And then on the other hand, they're kind of like, let's think more carefully about, you know, what the procedures are and, you know, whether that actually hinders our 
communication channels that have been established, right? And I think, you know, we could see that is not just the case of, let's say, Log4j, but the, we could talk about, like, the NIS directive. When all of these regulations come first, right, there's always this process of adjusting in many ways, like, is the timing correct for expecting certs to report? Um, is it responsible? I mean, it's, a, it's an understanding of what certs are responsible to do, like what's their responsibility, but at the end, I mean, is it feasible or not? And I think we're always trying to figure that out in, in one way or another. We have 10 minutes left, which I think it's like, thanks so much to my panelists for, for really sticking to the time. Uh, and I wanted to open the floor to all of you, um, whomever has any questions to the panelists. I definitely have lots of questions, and I imagine hope you have also questions to each other. But I wanted to open up the conversation. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Or any kind of comments or anything, if we have uh, government representatives in the room that would like to share also their views, that would be great. <laughs> or are we just very tired because it's the last year? Can I <laughs> just, just, yeah, like, can I, I yeah, absolutely go ahead. Double click into what Sparky was just saying. Um, I, I, I think co signing a lot of the same concerns um, and, and uh, would advise a lot of uh, policymakers to start thinking about what the impact, especially to the security research community, is going to be of any policies you're pursuing. Because it's not just some of the ones you were ci citing, but also you know the current negotiations around the Cyber Resilience Act in Europe, um, which would mandate uh, reporting of, of you know known exploited vulnerabilities uh, to you know central government agencies, which are not in a position necessarily then to, to take action to fix that um, and, and making sure that we're reporting in a way that is prioritizing getting a fix and keeping customers um, and, and users uh, secure. And also just emphasizing your point that there's then people who want to replicate that policy. You kind of create a race to the bottom where you have different imitators who are all sort of creating similar vulnerability reporting requirements, um, which may not be in the interests of, of actually the best product security and, and, and keeping um, the most sensitive data secure. Great. Any other points from the audience? No. Everyone's very tired. It's the last day of the IGF. <laughs> I get you. It's overwhelming. Um, I wanted to go back to Charlotte. Charlotte, if you're still online, hopefully. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Lovely, Charlotte. Charlotte, I wanted to follow up on, on let's say, this, um, the dimension of civil society organizations, right? I think it's undeniable when we're talking about you know, state responsibility, when we're talking about private sector responsibility, um, there's, a, there's an interesting spot, which is definitely the development of commercial hacking tools or spyware, um, which is often a very tricky um, topic, both for democracies and let's say those in the spectrum and even authoritarian regimes. So what kinds of accountability measures do we need to be setting in place to protect citizens from the misuse of those kinds of technologies? Thank you. It's a great question, and there's probably a very long answer, but I will try to keep it short in view of the time. Firstly, I think, uh, so the use of, of commercial spyware, surveillance tools, the associated lack of transparency, the consequences of its use and abuse uh, on human rights uh, and respect of laws. So we see this as a growing and very lucrative market. And I think the issue of accountability, first, we have to look at as being a responsibility of all actors. Um, particularly, we also have to look at the focus on how do we get redressable victims? Um, so if their governments are able to hold accountable those who cause the violations of human rights, how are vic what's the redress to victims? But if we look at some of the measures that need to be taken, and we've talked about this before on here, public attribution. So you have to be able to identify the actor and build on and complement and reinforce findings of any technical analysis um, into uh, achieve it, to achieve accountability, you have to be able to hold somebody accountable. So attribution is going to be a very important aspect of this. Um, then looking at what legal action, we've seen some countries who have taken legal action now, and so formal investigations, and then if those investigations build enough evidence and cases to then be able to bring um, legal cases, which will then focus attention on who commissions, who's financing and sanctioning um, that such abusive use of, um, of surveillance technology. And that can support driving accountability. Um, I think that we do, I think it's important to look at, you know, states have a legal obligation to protect and promote human rights um, and hold those who violate them to account. So, you know, looking at state responsibility and how states are taking up this responsibility is important. 
Um, and then also looking at how do you operate, operationalize accountability at the international level. And I think this is going, this is very important. So collectively governments have to shape the, the political and normative environment related to spyware and particularly where spyware is now being carried out as a service to um, and abusing human rights. So that needs to have a sort of coordinated response to uh, ensure responsible state behavior at the international level and to promote accountability between states because obviously there's a lot of cross-border issues that are, that are critical here. So states will have to act on their responsibilities um, in order to engage uh, individually and collectively um, to bring uh, perpetrators to uh, and, and hold them accountable. Um, but accountability also um, requires transparency. And I think that's one of the very difficult things about this use of offensive um, surveillance software or spyware or, uh, and that's something that has, there has to be a willingness to be much more transparent about what is today a very opaque market about the supply and the demand and the use. Um, so transparency is a really important step. Um, and then, yeah, as I say, I think there are a number of, um, um, of laws, norms that can be uh, brought to, um, to, that can be invoked. Um, and I think that's going to be very important to look at where human rights of individuals have been breached holding them to account that can be under something like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, the Covenant on e Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So there are a number of ways forward. I would just like to conclude by saying there is actually between a, a collaboration ongoing between a number of civil society organizations at the moment, um, and um, co-chaired by the Paris Call and the Cyber Peace Institute, where we're working on a multi-stakeholder agreement for transparency around this uh, spyware and uh, cyber mercenaries market. And this, uh, the first iteration of this will be brought to the Paris Peace Forum uh, in November. Wonderful, I see that you wanna, you wanna chip in. Yeah, just two quick points also on, on accountability, because I saw a colleague earlier today who, on the other side of IGF, um, she was saying, oh my goodness, we're having the exact same conversation on cybersecurity that we were having when I left cybersecurity five years ago. Um, but I, I like want to assure folks that things are moving forward, and especially as it relates to accountability. Um, you know, first on accountability via attribution statements. One thing that's been really exciting over the past year, year and a half, has been to see government start to really, for the first time, include uh, norms violations explicitly in attribution statements that they've released publicly, um, which has been sort of the first innovation in a public attribution statement that that I've seen in a while. Um, and my jaw dropped it when I saw it, so I, I hope yours, yours can now too. Um, and then the second piece is, it has to do with the sort of, again, that innovation of the use of uh, cyber operations uh, in, in the context of an armed conflict. And we did see just um, probably six weeks ago now, the ICC prosecutor come out and say publicly that his office has a mandate to and will be investigating the potential of cyber-enabled war crimes for the first time, uh, which when you think about what it would mean to uphold expectations for responsible behavior, um, both in the context of peacetime, but then really importantly in the context of warfare, that's a really important innovation um, or, or, you know, evolution as well. So just two more things. Absolutely. Any of the other panels who would like to chime in or have a tweet of a last remark? No, I'll trigger then uh, Regina and Pablo very quickly if they want to respond to this. So I think um, in terms of uh, the, the last point on thinking about transparency measures and accountability, um, over at the OEWG, there has been a lot of discussions as well as to whether include the actors like, you know, cyber mercenaries or include, you know, Spira as something that's more explicitly defined or, or made recognizable in the emerging threats kind of discussion there. Um, how can we evolve um, that particular kind of discussion? Is it ripe for inclusion or is it ripe for further kind of elaboration or discussion on, let's say, these kinds of emerging threats right now over there? Because I know this was one of, let's say, a key point of contention. So I don't know if, like, again, a tweet um, from either Regine, if you're still online, if you can hear us, or you, Pablo, putting in the last, last thought over there. Okay. Um, it's a good question. I think, uh, um, in, in my point of view, maybe personal point of view, every 
when it comes to in our conversation and how to move on at the end of the working group, you know, in different, you know, sections, it's sometimes we have to be very careful about what exactly we want to do there because, uh, you know, we have to agree by consensus. So that's the point, you know, how you can start a, a conversation, discussion, and things with definitely things that are important to put it out there. But uh, the other point is, if it starts some conversation, things are probably going to create maybe not the consensus we want. It's going to make m our conversation more difficult in the very end. So it's a difficult balance. Now, it is true that especially in the um, um, threats, you know, we were including, for example, artificial intelligence and new techniques. And But I still want to be sometimes a little bit careful because we, especially in AI, for example, that we were starting maybe other conversations, other discussion. And I think it's probably one of the challenges we have in emerging technologies, you know, where exactly we haven't discussed one thing or another. But uh, it's uh, still up to the state, you know, to in, in a way to try to see how we can address this point. Uh, the cyber mercenary can be something really challenging. I used to be in charge of mercenary years ago. It's, it's a concept that I've never seen before, but I think it, it's something that, uh, in, in a way, it is reflected, you know, the uh, concern of some state. In that case, of course, it's legitimate to discuss this in that forum because that is the place that we have right now to have this conversation. So, in a way, we cannot stop it, but again, how can you see if uh, we cannot not create this problem at the very end, especially at the end of Friday in the United <laughs> Nations when everyone wants to really, I mean, go back home and try to get this uh, a consensus. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for taking that last kind of like herd ball over there. Um, well, I just wanted to thank you all for sticking over here. I think having a, you know, a slightly kind of full room at the end of the IGF is not trivial at all. I hope you can stay in touch. The Global Partnership for Responsible Cyber ha Behavior has its, its website where you can access more information on our members, our institutional partners. And please do get in touch if you want to get involved in doing research. And I'd like to thank my panelists, Regine and Charlotte, that are online. Thanks a lot, and thanks to all of you, and keep in touch. <laughs>